Hey, you guys, we are live. It is Lisa Nicole Alexander, founder and executive director of Stand Up Survive. I'm so excited that you decided to join us tonight. So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to come on in. I have a special guest. But before I introduce her, I'm going to let you come in here for a second. So hang out, Dr. Bryant, real quick. I'm going to go ahead and do a couple housekeeping and share it to a couple pages. Um, you guys, tonight we have Dr. Carmen Bryant. She is a licensed mental health counselor, a trauma professional, and a U.S. Army retired. From the U.S. Army, she's retired. Is that correct? Did I say it right? Yes, ma'am. I mean, how could I not even say that right? What was that about? Anyway, I'm so honored that for your yes. I'm always thankful when you know someone says yes and when God brings someone into our path, you guys. So this tonight's going to be a treat. Hey, Dr. Bryant. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, we just had such a good time talking. So... Y'all come on in here. All right. They're in here, Dr. Bryant. So tonight we are going to be talking about narcissist abuse. Um, so you want to tell us about yourself really quickly before we get started? Well, I mean, I don't know what else to say. You said it all. <laughs> I'm a uh, licensed mental health counselor in the state of Washington. I am a retired uh, U.S. Army veteran, HUA, and um, I am a trauma professional. And uh, one of the things that I have picked up that is my passion is being an advocate for those uh, that are going through domestic violence and specifically or particularly uh, uh, those that have suffered at the hands of a narcissist or a person that may have narcissism, you know. So that is my specialization on the outside of my practice. But I, I find that many people come in and are being abused by a person with narcissism. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you real quick. Why did you choose that? Why narcissism? Um, you know, um, I myself am a survivor, uh, pretty stand up survivor. So mm -hmm. I. Myself, I'm a, a survivor of domestic violence um, at the time uh, when I was in active duty military. Um, I didn't realize that the person that was abusing me actually had narcissistic personality disorder. It's not something that is just, you know, we, we don't walk around diagnosing people. That's not most people. Uh, I, I think we were talking about this prior to this, you know, the big term narcissist abuse, narcissist abuse. No, it's domestic violence. And it just so happened, I knew I was going through domestic violence, but the problem was that the people around me kind of played it down or they didn't, you know, no one would believe me. You're a military soldier, you got, you're a leader. And so I was always advocating for everyone else. And I think vicariously, I was trying to save myself that I was helping. And it wasn't until after I left the military, it got really bad. Um, and then I began to focus on, because I was in school, my master's degree at the time, and I began to study abnormal psychology because I knew something wasn't right. Like most survivors, I knew something wasn't right. And this was not normal abuse. Something is not right. And um, as I was studying, studying, it wasn't until, thank goodness, after I divorced that I discovered I was married to a person that has narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Clearly diagnosed? No. But when you look at the pattern of behavior, he fit the pattern of the behavior to the T in the manual for, you know, for uh, uh, the DSM fit perfectly in that category. When I begin to recover, I begin to talk about it. I came on camera talking about it. Come to find out, I don't know how many thousands of people experienced it verbatim the exact same way. So I realized I said a lot of the domestic violence was being perpetrated by a person that possibly has narcissistic personality disorder. Okay. So I love, first of all, the fact that, you know, so many soldiers, so many people within the military experience domestic violence. I mean, they just mm -hmm. do. And it's not something that's so addressed and talked about. So that's, I know, definitely a topic for another day. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate you really touching on that because I know some people that are watching have experienced it while in military. Um, right. So. Uh, but I like that you separated the domestic violence and the narcissist abuse because everyone that's an abuser is not necessarily a narcissist. No, mm -mm. no. Yeah. That's very helpful to be very clear about that. So you answered my first question because it was going to be like, break down what narcissist abuse is. So, so, you, did. so you know, when, when we were just talking a few minutes before we got on camera, everyone keeps saying narcissist abuse. So they just pick out people that may be selfish. They may be you know, and I think we were joking about uh, someone may have road rage, but all of a sudden they're a narcissist or someone may not have matured yet or someone, you know, uh, a lot of time men are still out there sowing their seeds. So they have not matured yet in their role. Most people do have narcissistic traits. We call that pride. 
humanity, you know? So yes, a lot of people do have narcissistic traits and we have, to, you know, children, if you look at children, you look at cats, be honest with you, you look at cats, cats got narcissistic traits, but they're not narcissists. That's the nature of the animal. But then there is distinct. When you look in the manual, they at least have to have five out of the nine traits that, that were classified that group those symptoms in that, that, uh, special, that, that specifies that diagnosis. And so when you're talking about domestic violence, it is domestic violence. What they're doing is domestic violence. Whether they put their hands on you or not, it is domestic violence, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse, financial abuse, economic abuse, whatever it is. Then you separate the two by saying that this individual possibly has narcissistic personality disorder and they do things in a specific pattern. Most people, whether you're gay, you're black, you know, whatever language you speak, whatever religious preference you have, everybody can pick out those pattern of behaviors. It just mm -hmm. happened that each person is an individual person, but they all have the exact same pattern of behavior and they operate in cycles. Mm, and that's the thing. So, so for me to just say, because someone's a certain way, they're a narcissist. No, no, that's not no. the way it works. Okay. No. So I know, well, thank you for clarifying that because I know we're so quick, especially now to throw that term around. So it's important to know right. the definition of the term. So right. tonight we're going to focus on, and so Dr. Dr. Bryant, you're going to see kind of on the side of the screen, some comments come through. Feel free to address any or none at all. We'll do, <laughs> we'll do our best, you guys, to get to you. Okay. So we're going to talk tonight about trauma bonding. Okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not a trauma bonding expert, but I know that you have some great content to share with us tonight because a lot of people that we, that we talk to and help here at Stand Up Survivor say, I don't know why I can't get them out of my system. When they call, I come running. I feel sick. I just feel like I need to be with them. Maybe I can try and change them. All these things. How come I can't get over them? Um, so can we talk about trauma bonding and, and what yeah. it is? So, um, so since you told me to, to talk about the topic, of course, yes. I want I'm gonna look smart. So I just had to write a little notes down here so I can kind of stay on track. Interrupt me anytime. Okay. So the term trauma bond comes from a gentleman by the name of Patrick uh, Carnes. He termed the 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 phenomenon, which is the the behavior the, this phenomenon trauma bonding. Trauma bonding, he said, is a misuse of fear, excitement, and sexual feelings to try to trap or entangle somebody. So we know that when you're dealing with a narcissist, they're trying to entrap you or basically get power and control over you any way possible. And the way they do that is through your emotions because we're emotional people. So through the emotional, through it and a reaction, but they, they traumatically bond you to them. Hmm. Traumatically bond you to them. When you traumatically bond someone, you become addicted to the abuser. You know, that's what they call the Stockholm syndrome. The right. Stockholm syndrome is, um, and um, if you look at the terminology of where it came from, the Stockholm syndrome is an emotional attachment to the abuser. Like children that have been sexually abused by the parents, most people assume that that child would not want to be with that parent. But the child wants to be with that parent because they love the parent. But in order to appease the parent and to, and to um, you know, to, to uh, decrease retaliation or the, the, the pain that they feel from not complying, they actually side with the parent. They side with the parent, they love the parent, you don't talk about the parent. That's that trauma bond or that Stockholm syndrome. So in the, in the, in the cycle of uh, trauma bonding, what happens is, is they take you through a cycle, you know, in, in, in all narcissistic relationship, you're gonna go through a cycle of uh, idealization, devaluation, and discard. Mm -hmm. in, idealization stage, they're either love bombing you because they're trying to pull you in or they're hoovering you because they've already been in the relationship and discard it. And when they devalue, they're probably gaslighting or abusing you. And when they discard you, it's because you're no longer fun to play with. You've lost your luster. And so this is this reward and devalue cycle. So in that, in that cycle, what is happening with this narcissist in the idealization stage, when you're being love bombed, all your emotions are wide open that there's a chemical by the name of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a chemical that is released. You have children, right? I do. This is a chemical that is released when your cervix starts dilating, um, when you go into labor or when the, your nipples are stimulated by the baby to stimulate milk. It creates, it creates a bond with the baby. So that oxytocin creates a bond. You can even create addictions are created with this release of oxytocin. 
Then you have a chemical by the name of dopamine. Dopamine is, is technically called, uh, it's a feel good chemical. This, is, this has a lot to do with uh, mood, sleep, attention, uh, and pain processing. So think about it when the dopamine, all this is being flared up at the time that they're love bombing you, you're wide open. Serotonin, serotonin is a chemical in the nerve cells and, and it's found in your digestive system. And so it, it plays a role in sleep, anxiety, depression, healing wounds and bowel movements. That's why a lot of people, when they get out of these relationships or in the relationships with people, they have a lot of digestive problems. They have like bowel movement problems. They have diarrhea a lot because they're anxious. They have a lot of ulcers. They may be uh, constipated. They have problems with he wound healing. Their wounds don't heal. They're always sick. They're fatigued. They're tired. They're depressed. They're always on edge. You know, they're always on edge because that narcissist creates an environment in the home where you're always walking on edge. They keep you in this imbalanced state. Then you have the devalue stage. In the devalue oh, stage. Dr. Brian, hold on. Before you go forward, I got to ask yeah. you a question because that context oh, yeah, is so good. Okay. So you talked about the love bombing stage. And so you know how the cycle of abuse happens. You have a honeymoon, then you go into all that yep. stage. When it comes to the trauma bonding, is there a similar stage that happens? That, that, that is actually, so, you know, in the, in, in, if you look at the power and control wheel within domestic violence, when, when most people go like to the YWCA, if they go to like, um, Domestic, excuse me, domestic violence programs. You'll see the, you know, you see the. Uh, it's not called idealization. I don't have, it, I have it written down somewhere, but it's that cycle, and you know, it goes around to, you know, the uh, tension building, the honey, you know, the tension building, the blow up, the honeymoon phase. Yep. That's a, that is a constant cycle in a domestic violence. Well, what they didn't add in there is that take that cycle and put it into a narcissistic relationship, and the narcissistic cycle, the cycle that occurs. In a relationship, when you are in a relationship, a reoccurring cycle is idealization, devalue, and discard. This is a constant cycle within that relationship with the narcissist until you leave the relationship. That is the cycle you're always going to go through. Idealization, devaluation, okay. and discard. And then they come back and it starts all over again. Wow. Okay. So honeymoon season. So the idealization stage, is that like the love bombing stage when, when it's happening? Yep, that's that's love bombing. So that love bombing normally in the very beginning when a narcissist first sets their eyes on you, it take remember, they're the one, they're always the takers. They always take, take, take. They need feel, feel, feel. So when they're in a relationship, they're always fueling from the supply that they have attached to. That's why most people feel depleted. They feel empty. They feel their self-esteem. They they don't know if they're coming or going. They don't know if they're a boy or a girl. They don't know that, you know, they just in a fog because they're constantly pulling, pulling, pulling. When a narcissist is love bombing a new potential source of supply, that fuel that they take in, they're exerting the fuel on that new supply. So they're putting out a lot of fuel to pull you in. It's like a drug, a drug dealer gives you free cocaine or free crack in order to get you hooked on that crack. But there's a price you're going to pay for him or her putting out that much fuel because you grow impatient if you don't, you know. So in between that time, they're love bombing you. They have the old sort, that old supply because they need to go pull some supply, some fuel to refuel because you're taking too much fuel from them. Eee! Hold up now. Wait. Oh, my goodness. That makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes they say, well, I can't believe he's moved on so fast. How come he's already found a new supply? But we were, we've been together 10 years and we have kids, but how did that happen? And so what they're doing is pulling off of one source and giving it to a new source. Uh, y'all, I hope y'all caught that. I'm just going to say, I hope y'all caught that. For y'all that yep. had that question, I hope you caught that. Sorry, Dr. Brian, go ahead. Oh, no problem, no problem. Interrupt anytime. <laughs> that was so good. So they're pulling from one to feed Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Right. So that remember there. So if you're the new supply, they're putting all this energy in you. They're buying you things. They're they're paying attention to you. They're listening to you. They're calling you all the time. They're texting you all the time. And you think this is a perfect person. They understand me. They all they're taking you on vacation. They're, but that's a lot of energy they're exerting to pull you in. And and in those times, it's like they don't have. They're they only they're idolizing you. They're idolizing you. They're putting you on a pedestal. You're the best thing that has happened to them that moment. You're the most beautiful person. I've never met anyone like you. You have the new car smell. All of us like that new car smell. And so they like that new, you, the new shiny toy. And I'm going to do, and they're, you know, the eyes and they're listening to you. 
But while they're listening to you in that love bombing stage, like you and I will get to know each other and build rapport. So I know your boundaries. I know what is what is positive or negative. I know your character. For them, there is no such thing as building rapport. You're giving them the information that they need in order to figure out what your weaknesses are. So yeah. find out what your weaknesses are. So you're telling them what your last relationship was like. You're telling them what you like and what you don't like. You're telling them what you went through in your, but they're taking the, all that negative and all those gaps in your heart and what they're doing is, is you're creating the movie script for them and they're building the character to fit into those holes. So you two, it's like, you know, a chemical that, that like dopamine and serotonin is that chemical attachment. And so you feel good because this, and they're feeling good because you're a new toy, but you're draining them from energy. So they do contact that old supply and they love, they hoover that old supply to get some energy whether it's positive or negative ego boost, whether they cuss them out, they got some energy boost. Whether it's hoovering the kids, they got some, they got some fuel. But then they get refilled so they can come back to you because now they're energized to pursue you some more. But there is a price that you're going to pay for them exerting that much energy on you because then you're going to get to the devalue stage. Okay, wait. hold on. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. That part. <laughs> that was so juicy. Okay, wait. So I have to go back to this part. When you said that you're in that love bombing stage, I'm getting to know you. You get to know me. I'm giving you all the good information. This happened in my past. I was hurt this way. My family's this way. My fa and all they're doing is really writing the script. They're really writing their blueprint for how to hurt you moving forward. They're taking that and that is your kryptonite. You're yeah. <laughs> you are giving them the keys on how to break break you how to get control of you, because there is going to come a, a devaluing stage. Everything that you said, remember in the court of law says uh, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and be can and will be used against you in the court of law. Well, for them, everything that you say will be used against you to maintain control over you. Ah. Whoa. OK, I'm sorry. So everything they tell, they're using it to control you. Yes. Okay. I just had to say it again because sometimes yeah. we just get carried away and I need y'all to hear these things. Okay. Go ahead. No, you know what? I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, so if you're dating someone new and you're in this relationship, how do you know that it's not just somebody getting to know you versus love bombing? Um, when you are talking to them and they're wanting more information about you, but you know nothing about them and you find out that you're doing more talking than they are. You just, Blah, blah, blah. What they? What did the kids say? Diarrhea of the mouth. Yeah, yeah. And you're just giving it all away. <laughs> you just you telling all of your personal business. You're telling how you feel, and then when you when your emotions are high, like your emotions are high, you're feeling super good. That is too quick and too fast. Why are you feeling that way? Because if your emotions are wide open like that and you're just you're on cloud nine and this feels so good and you it's almost like you had a, a hit of marijuana or crack or whatever it is. But everything is moving so fast. But you never took the time to step back and say, wait a minute, I'm doing all this talking. I know nothing about him. He only gives you if you notice he mirrors what you say. He's not listening to you. He's listening for the pointers on how to control you. And what if you ever listen to like FBI interrogators, a, a person that is an interrogator to make you feel comfortable, mirror you. If you lean to the right, if you rub your chin when you talk, if you cross your arms when you're talking, if you lean back, if you lean forward, they mirror you to make you feel comfortable in their bubble. So they're mirroring your expression. They're mirroring, you lean forward, you look and you get emotional, they get emotional and they'll say the last thing that you say. You notice they're really not paying attention but they'll say the last sentence that you say to make you feel like they're listening. But they're not listening, they're listening to your weaknesses. They're listening to what is it that she needs me to be. What type of person she's educated, she has her own bit. I need to know everything that I can, that's why it's not good for us to tell everything about ourselves. And when a person is still broken or hurt from their last relationships or their last or even their family relationship, you have to be careful because we talk too much and we tell, you know, out of the heart flows the issues of life. And you talk and talk and talking because you have unresolved issues in your heart and you're giving them all the weapons they need 
to maintain control over you because the moment they they devalue you they're gonna come back and what they know is is you don't like for someone to ignore you so guess what in order to that's what they call positive and negative reinforcement it's called operant operant conditioning positive and negative reinforcement let me let me let me flip my page <laughs> so is the reward stage so to reward a behavior that you want to reoccur so i'm going to reward you every time you keep doing something i want you to do but then i'm going to punish you to de decrease a behavior i want you to stop so if i want you to give me control give me your money just something simple give me your money you're going to do what i say the way that i know that i'm going to hurt you i'm going to give you the silent treatment because you told me before, that's one of the things you hate the most. I despise a liar and I despise someone that just ignores me when I'm talking. So in order for me to make you do what I want you to do and you won't do it, I'm going to punish you with the very thing that hurts you the most. And most women or men, I can't believe that this person would take all the things that I gave them and use it against me. That was their whole purpose. Wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is powerful. I don't mm -hmm. know if y'all caught that, but that's deep. The very thing that you poured your heart out, he loves me so much, he wants to hear everything I have to say. He's now using that against me, or he or she is now using that against me to control me. And you can okay. and when you're when you're talking to him, when you're talking to him, you'll notice that they're either repeating something that you say, or all of a sudden they like what you like. And it's almost like, and when the first thing comes out your mouth is this is my soulmate. Mm -hmm. This person understands me me and him or me and her are just alike they're repeating what you're saying you say i love rick james and they're they like country music they're like i love rick james too they'll take that evening to figure out some songs that rick james played and they'll come back and say you remember super freak you remember this or or they or if say that they're you you like country you know and 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 let's say that you, you like gospel mm -hmm. They have nothing to do with the church whatsoever. But you what and they'll ask you, who are your this is what they do. Who are your famous favorite favorite artists? Oh, I like Yolanda Adams. I like Kirk Franklin. They you give them enough time when they separate from you, they go look up to see what it is you like, and they come right back to you to give you the information because you've already told them what it is you like. So now you're thinking, oh my gosh, we have so much in common. No, you don't. You told them what to go research. You told them what to go look for. Literally. And very later on, you wonder why they leave the relationship or they're in the relationship and everything that you loved about them that they presented to you is nothing that they are. Like they have, they hate gospel music because that's nothing that they listen to. Or they don't even like Rick James. They're into rock, you know. So everything that they said to you, eventually when they get comfortable, they just come out and they're comfortable with what they do. The other thing is, is one of the that most people don't recognize is nine times out of 10, when you meet the narcissist, you don't fall in love with the narcissist. You fall in love with their last supply. Oh. So you're not even in love with- oh, I almost identity. threw my pen, Dr. I almost yeah. threw my whole pen. Talk to us about that. What are you talking you about? Don't, you're not, when you meet a narcissist, the narcissist does not know you yet. They're watching you. They're trying to figure you out. They wonder like, what do you talk like? How do you act? you know, uh, what kind of education do you have? You know what, but when they first present themselves to you, they have the characteristics of the supply that they're with. So they take the good attributes from that last supply and they present you with that. Nine times out of 10, you're not falling in love with the attributes of the narcissist. You're falling in love with the attributes of their supply. Wow. And many times women want to fight the old supply mm -hmm. or you know, or men want to want to fight the old supply, but in actuality, it's the old supply you love, and that's what you keep looking for in the whole cycle of the relationship. So, in the whole cycle of that relationship, you always want them to go back to. I don't understand why you've changed. I just want the old so and so back. Well, the old so and so is the old supply. It's not the person you're looking for a guy that doesn't exist. You're looking for a person that never existed. That was a barrage, a facade. That is just crazy. I mean, that is just amazing. And everybody's like, yes, yes, yes. You're like, yeah, that, 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 that is a part of the trauma bonding that most people don't. When they wonder, why can I get away from this person? This person has literally, you know, invoked all your chemicals, yes. all your emotions. And most people say, how do they know this? 
How do I know as a therapist when you come in how to open you up? I know how to open you up. We are taught in school how to mirror you. Mm -hmm. yeah. are taught how to mirror you. In school, we learn how to mirror our clients in order to make you comfortable. We don't do it to hurt you. We do it to make you comfortable, to put you in a relaxed atmosphere, to put your guards down, to cause you to relax so that you tell me all of your business. And most people that have a good therapist, like, I can't believe I told you that. I've never told anybody that. That's a good therapist. Now, that therapist has to know how to close you back up to make you feel safe, maybe lighten the mood. And as a trauma professional, you know, it's already intense. So those last few minutes, I may change the topic and we'll laugh and joke about something to get you sealed back up so that I can send you back out. I can't send you out there wide open like that. A festering wound, you attract anything. So a good therapist knows how to. So if we know that as a therapist or as professionals, what more do you think that a narcissist knows? They know how to do it. They just don't have words to put to what they do. It's a it's a nasty, horrible habit that they have that they learn watching people. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. Okay, Dr. Brian. So let's go on to the devaluing stage and the discarding stage. Okay. So in the devalue stage, that's normally when you come across the, um, you know, the put downs. All of a sudden, you're not this perfect person anymore. Now they've discovered that you're a human being. So you're not as perfect as I thought you were. And I'm kind of growing, uh, you know, uh, a little agitated with you now because you're not as perfect as I thought you were. So this is where you find the gaslighting. The ga the gas is that crazy making. They'll do things on purpose now just to mess with you. They'll do simple things. You put your keys in the same spot every day. Who in their right mind would just take the keys and hide the keys just to watch you get frustrated and panic because you're going to be late for work? And then turn around and put the keys back and then watch you in frustration, in tears. Because that to them, that's fuel. That's an ego boost. I was able to make you do that. You all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden they put you down, but it's almost like on the sly, on the download, they say little things, you know, they, they, all of a sudden you notice that all that affection you used to get, you don't, mm -hmm. now those intimate conversation that you had, all of a sudden they're talking to you like this. I heard what you said. Mm -hmm. I, I, heard you, I heard what you said. And you're thinking like, that is so, that's not how you used to be. What's wrong? Then all of a sudden they're withdrawn. They may, you may have had wonderful sex. Now, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, not tonight. I have a headache. No, I'm just not. Or or all of a sudden you get the silent treatment. You know, you're getting the silent treatment because you're being punished, but you don't even know what you're being punished for. You know, uh, they blame you for stuff that, you know. And a lot of times what I tell people all the time is during that devalue stage, listen to what they're saying. Take it and flip it the other way. They're telling you what they're doing. They're telling you what they're thinking. But you take the responsibility and you own what they're saying about you. So you and your mind are trying to figure out how did I do that? How can I make this better? Oh my gosh, how did I feel? It's not you. They're projecting themselves on you. And if you quiet and you listen, they'll tell you everything that they're doing. They'll tell you everything that they're thinking. And they'll and if you flip it, you'll know everything. And most of the time we're so frustrated trying to protect ourselves, we don't catch it. Wow. So the devalue stage, you're not as relevant as you used to be. And normally when they start devaluing, they're back on the hunt again. Because they're looking for the next high. Okay. So during this stage is when we as survivors, we're, we're just willing to do anything they want us to do or asking for forgiveness or starting to do this better because they say we don't do this good enough. We're cooking better. We're having sex better. We're taking care of the kids better. All these kind of things in hopes that it'll still be enough to get us back up into that love bombing idealization stage. Right. And, and, everything, and everything that you're doing, because you're trying to win them back. Right. So Everything that you're doing is already out of character for you. It's not comfortable. It's not something that you would normally do. It's, uh, they can ask you things like, you look better with a, uh, with a tattoo on your back. And you're thinking like, I'm not even a tattoo type of person. That's because of the person that they're talking to probably has a tattoo on their back. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what? You didn't have a problem with my weight when you first met me. You thought I was great. But you know what? You could lose some weight. Mm -hmm. Same size I was when you met me. You know, you you are getting kind of fat. No, it's because the other person that they're now that they're not idolizing is smaller, or their hair is shorter, or their hair is longer, or they may be lighter, they may be darker. You need to wear great contacts, or you may you need to have an afro puff. You may everything that they're saying now. What you need to do is what they're looking at, and you're you're so focused on trying to win them back, you're driving yourself crazy and exhausting yourself trying to win this person's love back, win their affection back. And you're doing anything you possibly can that's out of character and is not something that you're going to do. If you lose weight for somebody, you're not going to maintain the weight loss because you didn't do it for yourself. 
you're doing to win them back. But if a person doesn't, if if you have to try to make a person love you, if you have to try to make them come back or or go back to make you're trying to fix yourself, but they're not doing anything because everything is your fault. They go to counseling, and the whole conversation pertains to the victim. Yep, absolutely, the victim. Now they will agree with certain things, but they'll go right back into that cycle. But everything is about the victim and what they're doing and how they're doing and how they're making me feel. That's usually when I pick up on something not right. Something mm -hmm. is, and when you when you focus the attention back on them, usually they get combative. They I'm not coming to counseling anymore. Yeah, this is that devalue stage. You know, this is that stage where. And if you have to try to win someone back, they don't care anyway. You shouldn't have to fight for someone's love. That should come yeah. They love you. And the truth is, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still not going to get them back to that stage. I just want to tell you, people throw their shoe at you. They said, teach that to Karma, tell it. So they are just like, hey, hold on, let me look. No, that's me okay, look. that's okay. It'll, it, let it me look. Be Okay, so oh, it's there all you go. Yeah, there go all the comments. There there go. Go. <laughs> okay, so during this, and I just want to share as a survivor, you know, it's like, that's a draining stage for as yes. a survivor. And it is, it's a lot. And you lose yourself in that season. You start to be exhausted. You may start to lose weight. You may start to not care for yourself because all your love and attention is going to begging them. And you didn't do anything wrong. Let's just go back to that right. stage. It has nothing right. to do with right. that. They've now become, like you said, they find a new supply. Okay, so let's go on to discarding stage because they've devalued you enough. Their eyes are on someone new. So this right. is the, the discard stage comes in. So now in the discard stage, this is this is when they've gotten bored with you. Your leather smell has worked. You ain't got that new leather smell anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's way, just on. in case anybody needs to know, it's actually not a leather smell. It's the glue smell of the car. You're actually smelling the new car smell is actually the glue in the car, not the leather. So now you've lost your glue smell and they're looking for they're looking for that new leather smell. Who doesn't like a car with a new leather smell? You know, like we open it up and we're oh my mm. So that's what you're looking for. That new. So you've lost your new car smell. You lost your, your glue smell. So they're going to look you, you now. You've lost your luster. You don't have a little tinker anymore. You know, you you're you're too human. You're normal. You know, you take your wig off at night and you actually have no hair. You know, I didn't have no hair when we went swimming. So what was the problem? You know, I wear lace right then. You took me swimming. We know what we look like, you know. So you, now all of a sudden there's a problem with you, but it's an excuse because now the discard stage is because they have focused their attention on another supply and or or they're just bored. Well, yeah, most of the time is they focus their attention on a new supply. They found something else that they want. So they're either going to one, put you on a shelf until they need you. So now mm -hmm. you're on preservation. They put you on a shelf until I come back and I need you. Because remember, now they're going to have to exhaust all that energy on that new supply. That's too much energy for me to give you any of my energy. So now you have been discarded, ghosted. They probably don't talk to you. You don't see them for a week or two, a few days, because they don't have enough energy to feed you energy and to feed the new supply energy. They'll come around when they need that energy boost from you so they can go back and do what they're doing. So now you have been shelved because they're going to come back in Hoover. They're going to come back in Hoover. They're going to come back in Hoover unless they find a supply better than you. Now, most people assume when I say better or when people uh -huh. say a source of supply better than you, it doesn't mean that they are better than you as a person. It just means they know nothing about the narcissist. They're perfectly innocent. They're full of fuel. They're idealizing the narcissist. It's the most handsome, most beautiful woman. This is the one. So they're getting all this accolade and oh my gosh. And I can't believe now, you know, that you now have become the villain because yes, she treats me this way. He treats me this way. And oh my gosh, I can't believe that they would treat someone like you. You're great. You're wonderful. But they're getting that fuel. So all that fuel that's inside of that, that, that gas station tank, even at the gas station, they got to get a fuel truck to fill the, the, the tanks back up from time to time. So remember, they're going to a freshly filled gas tank. That is a supply. That is a that is a uh, what we call it, a instrument, a supply, a car, a fuel tank with all that fuel. They don't know anything. They're innocent. They don't know anything about this narcissist. They don't know anything about the behavior. They don't even know anything about narcissism. So it makes them a good supply because they don't know anything negative. So everything negative about them, they put it on you. So they project all that on you so that they probably have a flying monkey who has become now their new source of supply that fights with them against you because of right. what you said to them. 
So right, this is, right. that is that discard stage. But believe you me, most people, when there's a Hoover that comes back and it's a big Hoover, it's because something has happened in La La Land. And okay, so the, the Hoover is when they're coming back around to you because now they've run out. Maybe they need some more supply. Just, but remember, during this hovering state, they don't love you so much. They don't miss you so much. They just can't be without you. No, they need more energy. They need more fuel. And see, and sometimes people people misunderstand the Hoover. For some of them, they do come back and Hoover you and I miss you. I love you. I made a mistake. This is the stuff that you want to hear because your fuel tank is empty. Because remember, you have been in a toxic trauma bond trauma bonded uh we can call it a drug addicted relationship you have been addicted to a person so now your tank is running empty and you're having crazy you're walking around like pookie you scratch yeah. because all you want is it, even if you don't give me positive attention if you cuss me out or come around and i see you it gives me a little bit that i can hold on to because i'm going through withdrawals and the withdrawals are so bad that women or men have stomach problems, headaches. You know, they can't sleep at night because they're they're detoxing. That's what's happening. They're detoxing. So and then there are other Hoovers where the Hoover might be through your kids. Mm, so, yes, they have decided I'm not going to con no contact, gray rock, whatever. So what they'll do is, is they talk to you through your children. And through your children, they'll send maybe pictures. They'll have conversations with them. And if you actually go look at the conversation that they have with the children, you can tell that the conversation is a conversation to you. Yeah, they're showing, they're showing pictures of their new supply, their new home, their new car. This has nothing to do that is age appropriate with the child, but you can tell that they're using that child to talk to you. That is a Hoover. You see what I mean? Yes. There may be other things like all of a sudden they go and like a picture you ain't heard from them you ain't seen them and all of a sudden they like one of your pictures like a young lady was telling me like the picture i was like you hoovering you mm -hmm. oh they're not hoovering me yeah they hoovering you they don't have to say much they just like a picture guess what they just told you they you know i'm here yep that's a hoover and then and in your mind you're thinking oh it's coming no because they keep you on edge and then all of a sudden two or three months later you may get another like you may get a poke on facebook you know, like, what is this? And in your mind, they're getting thought fuel because you're thinking about them now. See, now you're putting fuel out there. They're getting the energy just from the simple fact, I know you're thinking about me now. Yes, and that's just the way that they continue to try to control you. Absolutely. Okay, so because you because we went there, now we're gonna gear you guys into no contact because I think it's a perfect segue into going no contact because you mm -hmm. talked about this being similar to an addiction. Like literally, I can remember what my man, you just feel so sick, you don't know what to do. Even if it's negative attention, it's yes. still attention that still feels that need for you yes. during the relationship. Yes. So let's talk about no contact because I know oftentimes we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but sometimes when you have children, it's hard to go no contact. So let's talk right. about the no contact, how important it is. So if you think about it for a minute, you know, uh, whether you have family members or friends or whatever, and um, let's say they need to go to drugs. OK, one of the worst addictions that I have seen so far in my office was the heroin addiction. Heroin. Those are the two. And I don't know why heroin is coming back up, you know, but the heroin addiction and the meth addiction. Usually the heroin ones that I have seen have been pretty bad. And usually when, when you're talking about rehabilitation, a lot there's going to be some relapses before they get total sobriety. But a lot of them end up having to go into treatment. When they go into treatment, they're basically isolated from everybody. They're isolated. They, they can't talk to anybody for, for a certain amount of weeks. Their whole environment is controlled. You know, when they eat, when they get up, they're creating new habits, new patterns. You know, they're, they're going to group counseling. It is a very controlled environment. They're learning things. They're around people that have similar problems to them. And and they're talking to counselors and the counselors is telling them, you cannot be a social drug addict. It doesn't work for you. You have to, just like an alcoholic, you can't be a social drinker. You are addicted to alcohol. You no longer can drink alcohol, period. Your best way to keep you from being triggered is to isolate yourself or separate yourself from bars, social gatherings where liquor is gonna be around and prepare yourself for certain triggers. I've had a young lady say that she can't go get flu shots because as soon as she sees the um, needle, she starts having triggers and her mm. taste for heroin because she was an intravenous user. She says, or looking at veins. She said, I can't look at my own veins because when I see my veins, I'm triggered. 
So now they're teaching them certain things. That's no different than a person that has been addicted to a narcissist because they got you addicted to trauma. The tra traumatic bonding is an addiction to a person. It's not addicted to your, well, you are addicted to the, let's, let's put it this way. They're not addicted to the person. They're addicted. The narcissist is addicted to the fuel. Mm -hmm. You're addicted to the person. There's a that, difference. That, 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 and, and what happened because of that cycle, that abusive, you know, that the devaluing, that the behavior, you know, the abuse that you have gotten used to, your chemicals are now depending on that person to make you feel good, feel bad, feel good, feel bad, feel good, feel bad. When you get away from this person, the no contact, remember, you got problems with your thought process because of those chemicals. You got problems with your thought process. It feels like you're walking around in a cloud. You can't think straight. Every time you make a decision, you're you're triggered because of the fact that every decision you make, you always hear their voice in the background. I don't yeah. want to guess because if I do this, this is what he thinks. You're not even with him or you're not even with her. You know, no decision you can make, but that's stupid. Well, who told you that was stupid? Who told you you were stupid? Who told you that you couldn't make it? So that no contact gives you an opportunity to isolate yourself from the abuser because that abuser knows that narcissist knows if i keep interjecting what i say you, it, it'll run you crazy you can't think straight i got to make decisions really quick you're always anxious you're always i can't deal with my family you know my family's against me but when you separate yourself and you go no contact it gives you an opportunity to step back gather yourself get your thoughts together and that fog starts clearing that mm -hmm. fog starts clearing. you start thinking straight you start realizing what has happened to you i can't believe this you're more open to people's advice. You're more open to people teaching you about what has happened. But the moment you break that no contact, what is happening is, is you're building up a shield or a force field to protect yourself. Every time you go no contact, they eat at the armor that you put up. They eat and, you know, and they keep, tearing, they keep peeling at you and they keep tearing it up until you are a broken person again. You know, and you back from it. And this time, when you go back this time, Every time you go back is worse than the first time because they can't let you escape the same way. So the no contact gives you an opportunity to gather your thoughts, get your thoughts together. Now, for those people that, you know, and to clear your mind, but those people that have children, it makes it a little more complicated. I kind of commend them because a person that doesn't have children is just as bad. Don't get me wrong, but they don't have any stakes. They don't have to concern themselves with me and you have a child and now I've got to protect my child and I got to protect me, meaning that sometimes I have to compromise and I got to take the hit as opposed to letting my child take the hit. So I got to stand in between me and my child and I got to take the hit emotionally in order to protect my child. For those that don't have kids, they don't have to do that. For those that have children, sometimes that narcissist knows that you're going to have to compromise to a certain extent. They know that you're going to have to talk to them. But when you talk to them, most people assume because most of us have a healthy thinking like my child needs the father. My child needs the mother. I'm trying to be cordial. That is a normal type of breakup. But with a narcissist, everything they do is intentional. There is no accident. There is no cordial. There is no co-parenting. It's always counter-parenting. And everything they do and everything they say, I promise you, it is all intentional. And so anything you do with that narcissist, it has to be gray rock. It's only about the child. If you ask me any other question, I'm not obligated to answer. But for some people trying to keep the peace, I'm trying to be You're frozen, Dr. Bryant. Come back. You're frozen. Let me see if she comes back in, y'all. Ciao. Hey, you guys, hopefully she pops back. I know she was on fire. I'm just saying it wants to mess with us. So hold on one second.
I think you're the back, Dr. Brian. You're back. You you're back. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> you, how, how about this? They said you were on fire, and then oh. but you, but well, you I guess our whole Wi-Fi was on fire, huh? Was, but we, we already know what this is, so let's just keep going because so you were on fire. Oh my goodness, you were talking. I don't even know. Gray rocking, gray rocking, right? Oh. You got, so you guys tell us in the comments if you see her coming back in. We're good. Look, they said yeah. no, come back. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Okay. We're back. We're back. Okay. So what I what I was saying was is that you know, for those those that have to deal with the parent, you know, and 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 know that in your heart and in the court system, they want you to co-parent. So they'll send you the counseling. They send you to uh, what's called a uh, reconciliation counselor. But a lot of them do not understand narcissist abuse. OK, domestic violence with a narcissist. And so their whole concept is is reconciliation, learning how to communicate between the two. And you have to learn. to There is no such thing. Everything that a narcissist does is intentional. They use the children to get at you. They look very innocent and they look like these great mothers and great fathers to people. But in, in everything they do is intentional. And really what's happening is, is they're tearing up the little hearts of these kids because the kids are the chess pieces on top of this chess game. And guess what? They're, if anybody that uh, I don't know chess that well, but, you know, on a chess game, the whole objective of the game is to get the queen. So male, female, whoever, but is to get the queen. So you have once you get the queen, the game is over. The sad part about it is you have all these pawns on here. And those kids are the pawns because they're after you. Everything is about you. They're trying to pay you back for discarding. They're trying to pay you back for not talking to them. Anything they can possibly do. And in the midst of all this, these kids are being hurt. And so the biggest thing when it comes to gray rocking is, is stop telling them all your business. They're not your BFFs. Everything that they do is intentional, especially those of you that are still going through court cases. You know, a lot of that information that you're putting out is info. Hey, I just I'm just checking on you. See how, you know, we're in the middle of the COVID and everything. Hey, I know your business. Hey, Miss Lisa. Hey, you know, your business. You know, I'm just making sure you're OK. Do you need anything? What they're looking for is for you to say, oh, child, I'm doing much better because you're trying to make sure they know I'm doing better without you. But what you don't realize is, is you're giving them information. I'm doing much better so they can use that against you in court. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that you say is not going to be held against you. So gray rocking means Take your emotions out of it because they're looking for a trigger. I mean, they're looking for a reaction. You have to stop and think. And sometimes, sometimes it's best not to argue back. Be quiet. You don't always have to defend yourself. That's the biggest problem because a lot of times we're wanting to defend ourselves. You don't have to let them talk. The one thing that a narcissist cannot stand is when you don't dialogue back with them. It drives them crazy. If you want to see a narcissist defeated, don't respond back. Yes. No. Take your emotions out. Go talk to your friend and be emotional with your friend. Go talk to your therapist. And, and it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. And they were so sexy and smelled so good. They did it on purpose. It was intentional. They intentionally put on that cologne that you met them in. They right. intentionally wore that outfit that they wore. They specifically put on that lace front wig that they, that you liked so much when, they, when you first met them. The, everything is intentional. So you have to know that you you when you were in a game of, of war in the military, you have to know your opponent. You have to, we don't, in the military, we don't go to war without studying the opponent. That's why you have Navy SEALs, CIA, special forces, these political assassins, they go and study the enemy in order to bring intel back to teach us how to fight the enemy. No different than dealing with a narcissist. How are you fighting the narcissist with their weapons? You're fighting fire with fire. You can't put out fire with fire. It doesn't work. What firefighter, you, you know, goes to a burning building and sprays the building fire? That's what most people are doing, especially when it's called gray rocking. Gray rocking, take the emotions out. Yes, you're going to be emotional. Take the emotions out. Res res respond. Don't react. They need a reaction to feed them. When you don't give it to them, you're starving them. They don't know what to do. And especially those of you that are going back into court, when you starve them of that fuel and you don't give them a reaction, it causes them to make mistakes in the court system. It causes them to make mistakes. They talk too much and tell them themselves. And that's how you win your case. You got to shut up sometimes. You know, let the lawyers handle it. You know, stop talking because you're trying to defend yourself. You're talking too much. Gray rock. Take the emotions out of it. 
You know, I love when you said that we try to defend ourselves because I think as a survivor, as a victim, you don't get to defend yourself. Nobody was listening. Nobody understood what I went through. I just want to tell them. And we're over there just dumb fight, like bumbling over our own words. But the point mm -hmm. of the matter is they're using whatever we say against us. Gray Rockham, do you want to pick up the kids? Yes, no, I'm picking up the kids, three o'clock. That's it. All that emotion or why do I feel this way or why do you treat me this way is irrelevant. None of it matters. Does it hurt? Yes, like you said, call up a exactly. girlfriend, talk to your therapist, but don't do it with them. Do not emote with them. You know, think about it for a minute. Whenever there's a 911 call to the um, to the police, by the time the police gets to the door, who's the one that's most emotional? We are, of course. And we, just look, we look crazy, like nuts. Because And they're calm. Them. Oh, yeah. And they're calm because they're getting fuel. They're getting fuel out of it. And they, they look. And so guess who gets arrested? The person that's irate. That's there are some police officers, though, that are now learning. So yep. You know, thank God there are some police officers that are now learning about narcissism. Well, they already know when I show up, if she's overreactive, let me pay attention to the other person. So mm -hmm. some of them are learning. There are some that are learning, but there are still some that still need to be trained. You know, therapists as well, doctors as well, you know, the court system, lawyers, family law, you know, judges as well. And do you have a right to feel frantic and hysterical? Absolutely. Absolutely. Think about everything that just happened to you, but understand that in that moment, it defeats the whole purpose, especially right. when it comes to those that are still in court with their abuser. That's Absolutely. a really, really big one. And I like how you talked about how they try to use the kids against you. It's not about you. They don't care. The kids are looking out the window waiting for them to come pick them up. It's not if they can't see you or they don't have access to you, then they don't even want to be bothered with the kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, and the crazy part about it is, is, they go after what hurts you the most. And what most parents know is that they love their children and they want to do everything they possibly can do to protect their children. They love their kids. That is the apple of my eye. That narcissist knows it. So whatever they can do to hurt you, they'll do it. They're trying to take your kids. They're not taking the kids because they love the kids and they want the kids in their home. They're messing with you or trying to get the kids because of the fact that um, that they know is going to hurt you. So by the time they have the children and the children at the house, the children are of no value to them anymore. So they they're ignored. They're rejected. They're abandoned. They're yelled at. And a lot of kids vicariously are abused because of you. Don't look like your mother. Don't look like your father. And you narcissist, that narcissist will begin to handle that child like is you. And so they'll go after that child or attack that kid because that child may have your characteristics, may have your looks. So now wow. they're being abused because of you. Wow. That, that's, that's how dark a narcissist really is. Wow. You know, I've had some, some women share that, oh, well, he comes over and he tucks the kids in or he comes over like uh, that boundary should never be crossed. You're the, the moment they step foot past that door, they feel like they own the home all over again. And so there's some boundaries I think that should be very black and white. And you are the person as the victim survivor who controls those boundaries. You have to put Absolutely. your boundaries, no matter how, how hard it is and how much it hurts. You have to have boundaries. Absolutely. Because they're not used to you having boundaries. After they oh, suck the life out of you, Boundaries when when they say you're killing me, you're hurting my heart, you're hurt, you're abusing me, is because you have boundaries. If, if you want to if you want to torment a, a torment a narcissist, have boundaries. Have boundaries, y'all. And and let no be a whole sentence. Whole sentence, a whole paragraph. A whole no. no exclamation mark. Period. Mm -hmm. the, one of the most powerful statements you could ever make is no, because remember during the um, the value stage, you were there was no such thing as no. Everything that you could possibly do, you were doing things that you would have normally said no to. You don't say no to anymore. Operate conditioning. Remember, positive, yep, have, have, yep. negative reinforcement. If I want you to keep doing what you're doing, for example, if I want you to keep giving me money out of your bank account, if I want you to keep taking me out to dinner, if I want you to keep buying me clothes, if I want you to keep buying me a new car, I'm going to give you love and affection. I'm going to reward you with what you want. Just like an animal, I'm going to reward you with what you want. I'm going to give you affection. I'm going to give you attention. I'm going to make sure I rub your arm. I'm going to tell you how much I love you. But the moment you tell me no, now I'm going to go back with positive reinforcement. Now I'm going to punish you for not doing what I told you to do. Now I'm going to stop talking to you. I'm not going to sleep with you. I'm going to sleep downstairs. I'm not sleeping in the room with you because you are not compliant with what I... But think about when you come to power and control, that is completely confusing. They can tell you to stand up and you stand up. They tell you to sit down and you sit down. Then they hit you anyway. You trying to figure out like I did everything. What did you I do? Now you're confused. 
It's, yeah. it's because of the fact that they just want power and control. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Brian, you are amazing. You are the bomb. You're on fire. We Thank I'm you. just so thankful that you said yes to coming on. So you guys, we have Dr. All Brian right. for like two more minutes. So I'm going to give you her information really quick coming across the screen. I know you want to connect with her. I know you do. I know Aww. you do. So I'm going to put it up here on the screen real quick. Okay. So you can find her on YouTube. You guys, she has all of these different trainings on narcissist abuse all over YouTube overcoming narcissist abuse, make sure you go subscribe to her page now. Like as soon as you get off the slide, go subscribe because it's, she goes in depth in a lot of different videos. So you don't want to miss it. Okay. All right. So she also, ha you have Podbean. Is that a podcast you have? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Facebook and Instagram, which is why I, I find on Instagram, you guys, you know, how I stalk people. So on overcoming narcissist abuse on Facebook and uh -huh. on Instagram. And I don't know if I, I told you guys that she is the owner of Psychological Health Consultants and Services. So, Dr. Brian, thank you so much. You came with that style. Oh, Let me tell you. Thank you. People have loved you. They, they just met you like, we love you. Okay. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so honored that you would consider me. I'm so thankful that you said yes. I'm always thankful. I know God sends exactly the person that's supposed to be sitting in this seat every time. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. They said that you're incredible. They said thank you for everything that you said. Anyway, you guys, we will see you next week, Dr. Bright. Anything you want to say? No, I, I just want to apologize to those. I know some of my subscribers are on here looking for me, but as I was telling you, I'm changing offices. So this is the only time they get to see me this week. Uh -huh. So just to let you guys know, I'll be back. I'm just changing offices. I have to get a new office. And so that has taken up a lot of my time. So all the subscribers that I asked to come and support you a lot. So I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Well, glad you came. Hey, y'all. And everyone else that is here, please go subscribe. She has amazing content. So thanks for hanging out with us. And we will see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye.